Hello, this is Ben Television News Roundup, a compilation of major stories in the weekend in Antunde Alabi. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, has predicted that UK economy will grow by 2.7% in 2015. The economy as a whole grew by 2.6% in 2014, according to the Office of National Statistics figure, ONS. This was up from 1.7% in 2013. The Chancellor, George Osborne, has insisted that the government economic policies are working. Well, it's very welcome, and I think it is a significant move by the European Central Bank, but it is necessary, not sufficient, for the European recovery. We had central bank support through the Bank of England doing a quantitative easing programme, but alongside that, we've had credible fiscal policy, economic reform, competitive tax rates, and they've contributed to Britain being one of the fastest growing major economies. If you want to see this ECB action work in practice, it's got to be accompanied by clear leadership, real economic reform, all the things that sadly have been lacking in too many Eurozone countries. There's around £30 billion of consolidation required. £25 billion of that needs to come from public expenditure savings in welfare and in departments. £5 billion can come from further action to stop aggressive tax planning, tax evasion, tax avoidance. These are real steps we take to make sure we collect taxes and people make a fair contribution. Can we afford our government? Can we afford our welfare system? Uh, we face enormous competition. Here we are at the World Economic Forum. People are talking Britain up. They can see Britain's pulling ahead from our European neighbours. Figure also showed that the economy slowed in the final three months of 2013, allowing the opposition to challenge the coalition's economic programme. Still on the UK economy, in the meantime, the Prime Minister David Cameron and Labour leader Ed Miliband have continued to clash over the state of the economy and each leader whom voters are held of the May elections with their economic policies. The news out today shows a record number of people in work, a record number of women in work. We are seeing wages growing ahead of inflation and we're also seeing disposable income now higher than any year that was under the last Labour government. As for his figure of £1,600, it doesn't include any of the tax reductions that we have put in place again and again under this government. That is the truth. And the fact of the matter is, Mr Speaker, he told us there'd be no growth, we've had growth. He told us there'd be no jobs, we've had jobs. He told us there'd be a cost of living crisis, we got inflation at 0.5%. He's wrong about everything. He's raised taxes on ordinary families, he's raised VAT, he's cut tax credits. The reality is that people are worse off on wages and they're worse off on taxes under this Prime Minister. Now, now, he thinks everything is hunky-dory. Did he even notice this week the report that came out that said half of all families where one person is in full-time work can't make ends meet at the end of the month? You can work hard, play by the rules, but in Cameron's Britain you still can't pay the bills. That's the reality. I, I study every report that came out. He's referring, of course, to the Roundtree report. And the Roundtree report says this. The risk of falling below a socially acceptable living standard decreases as the amount of work in a household increases. And under this government, we've got over 30 million people in work. We've got the lowest rate of young people claiming unemployment benefit since the 1970s. Long-term unemployment is down. Women's unemployment is down. We are getting the country back to work. And in terms of living standards, we've raised to £10,000 the amount of money people can earn before they start paying taxes. And people who are in work are seeing their pay go up by 4%. But if we'd listened to the right honourable gentleman, none of these things would have happened. If we listened to them, it would be more borrowing, more spending, more debt, all the things that got us in a mess in the first place. Mr. Speaker, he is the person who has failed on the deficit. And, and this Prime Minister... And this Prime Minister, and this Prime Minister says, this, this Prime Minister never had it so good and he's totally wrong. Now he doesn't notice, he doesn't notice what's going on because life's good for those at the top. 
Can he confirm that while everyday people are worse off, executive earnings have gone up 21% in the last year alone? Prime Minister. He criticises me on the deficit. He's the man who couldn't even remember the deficit. And also, he's now had four questions and not a single word of welcome for the unemployment figures out today. Behind every single one of those statistics is a family that with someone who can go out to work, who can earn a wage, who can help give that family security. We are the party that is putting the country back to work. Labour are the party that would put it all at risk. Total complacency about one month's figures when he's had five years of failure under this government. Now, under him, we're a country of food banks and bank bonuses, a country of tax cuts for millionaires while millions are paying more. Isn't his biggest broken promise of all that we're all in it together? Oh, dearie me. You can see the problem that Labour have got. They can't talk about the deficit because it's coming down. They can't talk about employment because it's going up. They can't talk about the economy because the IMF, the President of the United States, all say the British economy is performing well. So what are they left with? Well, I'll tell you, Mr Speaker, they've got an energy policy to keep prices high, they've got a minimum wage policy that would cut the minimum wage, and they've got a homes tax that has done the impossible and unite the Honourable Member for Hackney with Peter Mandelson. Now, to be fair, to be fair to the Honourable Gentleman, we, we learnt at the weekend, we learnt at the weekend what he could achieve in one week in Doncaster, where he couldn't open the door, he was bullied by small children, and he set the carpet on fire. Just imagine what a shambles he'd make of running the country. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is a Prime Minister. This is a Prime Minister denied. Oh, 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 it may well be the session will take a bit longer, but questions and answers. That's fine by me. But however long it takes, the questions and the answers will be heard. Ed Miliband. I've got to say to the Prime Minister, if he's so confident about leadership, why is he chickening out of the TV election debate? This is, this is the Prime Minister who will go down in history as the worst on living standards for working people. He tells people they're better off, they know they're worse off. Working families know they can't afford another five years of this government. <laughs> why don't we, Mr Speaker, leave the last word to the head of the IMF, who often quoted by the Shadow Chancellor, who today seems to be having a quiet day, and I can see why, because our economy is growing, people are getting back to work. She said this, the UK, where clearly growth is improving, the deficit has been reduced, where unemployment is going down, certainly from a global perspective, this is exactly the sort of result we'd like to see. More growth, less unemployment, a growth that is more inclusive, that is better shared, a growth that is sustainable and balanced. That is the truth. Every day this country is getting stronger and more secure, and every day we see a Labour Party weaker and more divided and more unfit for office. Now to the U.S. President visit to India, U.S. President Barack Obama and India Prime Minister Narendra Modi have agreed on economic and nuclear deals that will see India become one of America's biggest economic and military partner. Mr. Obama was India's guest on the country's Republic Day where he promised to support India's economic and nuclear power efforts. India represents an intersection of two men who have always inspired me. When Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was protesting racial segregation in the United States. He said that his guiding light was Mahatma Gandhi. When Dr. King came to India, he said that being here in Gandhi's land reaffirmed his conviction that in the struggle for justice and human dignity, the most potent weapon of all is nonviolent resistance. And those two great souls are why we can gather here today, Indians and Americans, equal and free. And there's another link that binds us. More than 100 years ago, 
America welcomed a son of India, Swami Vivekananda. And Swami Vivekananda helped bring Hinduism and yoga to our country. And he came to my hometown of Chicago. And there, at a great gathering of religious leaders, he spoke of his faith and the divinity in every soul and the purity of love. And he began his speech with a simple greeting, sisters and brothers of America. So today, let me say, sisters and brothers of India. My confidence in what our nations can achieve together is rooted in the values that we share. For we may have our different histories and speak different languages. But when we look at each other, we see a reflection of ourselves. Having thrown off colonialism, we created constitutions that began with the three same words. We the people. As societies that celebrate knowledge and innovation, we transformed ourselves into high-tech hubs of the global economy. Together, we unlock new discoveries, from the particles of creation to outer space. And we are among the few nations to have gone to both the moon and to Mars. And here in India, this dynamism has resulted in a stunning achievement. You've lifted countless millions from poverty and built one of the world's largest middle classes. And nobody embodies this progress and this sense of possibility more than our young people. Empowered by technology, you are connecting and collaborating like never before on Facebook and WhatsApp and Twitter. And chances are you're talking to someone in America, your friends or your cousins. The United States has the largest Indian diaspora in the world, including some three million proud Indian Americans. And they make America stronger, and they tie us together, bonds of family and friendship that allow us to share in each other's success. So for all these reasons, India and the United States are not just natural partners. I believe America can be India's best partner. I believe that. Of course, only Indians can decide India's role in the world, but I'm here because I'm absolutely convinced that both our peoples will have more jobs and opportunity, and our nations will be more secure, and the world will be safer and a more just place when our two democracies, the world's largest democracy and the world's oldest democracy, stand together. I believe that. So here in New Delhi, Prime Minister Modi and I have begun this work anew, and here's what I think we can do together. America wants to be your partner as you lift up the lives of the Indian people and provide greater opportunity. So working together, we're giving farmers new techniques and data, from our satellites to their cell phones, to increase yields and boost incomes. We're joining you in your effort to empower every Indian with a bank account. And with the breakthroughs we achieved on this visit, we can finally move toward fully implementing our civil nuclear agreement, which will mean more reliable electricity for Indians and cleaner non-carbon energy that helps fight climate change. And I don't have to describe for you what more electricity means. Students being able to study at night, businesses being able to stay open longer and hire more workers. Farmers being able to use mechanized tools that increase their productivity. Whole communities seeing more prosperity. In recent years, India has lifted more people out of poverty than any other country. And now we have a historic opportunity, with India leading the way, to end the injustice of extreme poverty all around the world. Mr. Obama and Modi pledged to increase their bilateral trade fivefold from the $100 billion a year and also build cooperation on defense projects. From politics to economy, business, technology, the totality of what 
mix now now is all ready to get on this sponge we give you the information that you need from business to economy to politics to technology and that's all we do here on this sponge from the beginning to the end and that is why we are here keep watching this sponge from the television and today This is all we have for you on this episode of News Roundup this week. Thank you for being part of it. I'm Tunde Alabi and see you again. Bye.